Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And providentially, we're going to be talking about food on Father's Day. This is uh, God's sense of humor for us. We're talking about food on Father's Day. Now, this is unlike any food uh, that we are accustomed to where, you know, we're probably some fathers are going to grill out today or go check out some cars or do something lazy at home. Uh, this is speaking specifically about food offered to idols. And we're going to discuss what that means and why it's a problem. But before we do so, let's read the text so that we know what we're going into this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 begins by saying, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, Father from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist." However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge of eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother of, for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. So that is the word of God this morning. That is the text that we will address for the next coming Sundays. And as a matter of fact, the sections between chapters 8 all the way through chapter 11 will deal roughly with the same subject. As a matter of fact, in chapter 10, we'll read a little bit of chapter 10. It addresses food offered to idols once more, this is a common practice in the Roman world. But what does this have to do with Christianity? And what does this have to do with us? Well, what Paul's driving at here is something that we should be completely aware of. Those ending verses, all the way from 7 through 13, really highlight for us the true issue. That's the weaker brother. And in our knowledge, Paul says, most of us would consider food as simply being food. But while those who are coming from that background in idol worship in, Roman, in, in Corinth, they feel different. And they may be weaker than some of the stronger so-called Christians in the church. So by eating the food offered to idols, what they're doing is they're making their weaker brothers feel ashamed and defiling their conscience. Because they're coming, think about this, they're coming from a pagan background where idol worship was a common thing in their societies, as we'll look at in a, in a bit. They're coming from that background where they were worshiping these idols and then sacrificing the, this meat. And then eating it in consummation and in honor to that deity or that God or that Lord. Now they step into the church and the church people are doing the same thing. So to them, as they participate in that eating of the food, they're thinking about like, wait a second, but this was, this is what I used to do. This is idol worship. I used to worship my idols 
like this, and it was making them feel guilty. Christians, on the other hand, are saying in, in, in chapter 8, they're saying, well, it doesn't matter, bro. It's fine. It's cool. Chill. Relax. It's just me. It's just a burger. Like, that's it, man. You know, it's, don't worry about it. You're good. And so even if their weaker brother found it to be unsettling and found it to be for them difficult, they didn't care. So what Paul is addressing is not necessarily what to eat and what not to eat. It's not like we're going to spend this morning talking about, hey, what, what good food can we eat? Where can we eat? McDonald's, Burger King, what's the, you know, what's the verdict? Coke, Pepsi. No, we're not going to discuss, as Paul does, not discuss what food is important. Bigger issue here is building up God's people instead of destroying them. And so for Paul, this this ending verses, look at verse 11 again. And so by your knowledge, this weak, weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died. Like Paul puts it in that context. He is saying, your freedom, your nonchalantness about food is destroying a person that Christ has died for. And he goes on to say, making this a huge matter, in verse 13, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. That's a, that's a big statement. I don't know many people or many men today that would dare say something like that. I will never eat. Another burger, if it would make my brother stumble. I, 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 it's, not, it's not a reality today. Imagine grilling and everybody's out on the summer, 4th of July. Everyone's got the grill out, the hot dogs. And you're like, I can't eat meat because my brother, I don't want to make him stumble. It, it just wouldn't happen. Paul makes this of utter importance because Paul's in the business of unity and building of Christ's church not of destruction. So what we're going to find out today and what Paul is going to build towards and begin to address, and again, as we began our study in 1 Corinthians, it it isn't just some abstract book that we're going to be reading about certain different subjects. This all has to deal with the church. This all has to deal with people. This all has to deal with brothers and sisters in Christ and being united as One, as we saw from the very beginning of the book, divisions are plenty. Divisions amongst God's people are plenty. We cannot survive, basically, Paul is saying. We cannot survive if we simply go at each other's throat on a consistent basis and destroy each other. How do we create a culture of unity, therefore, in the body of Christ? Now, you got to think about this. We're talking about food, but we're also talking about unity and brotherhood and being together as God's body, as the bride of Christ. How do we create this culture, then, that unites us? How do we build each other up instead of tearing each other down? This is something that we often see even in marriage. Can I build my wife up? It's often easier to tear her down. Can I build my husband up? It's often easier to tear him down. There's a popular meme that many of you may have seen years ago and probably a decade or so ago. And I don't even think they were called memes back then. But whatever it was, it was some kind of a meme where it had some images of mice. Now, I know that's not the image that you want to see on a Sunday morning at 9 a.m., There's an image of mice, and it has little squares around, you know, kind of like a meme cuts it up. And and the mice have, have, have built somehow a ladder to get out of the bucket. They were trapped inside of a bucket, and they built with their bodies a ladder to get out. 
And they get out, and little one by one, they're all climbing out of the, the ladder that they built for themselves. You know, they put their bodies there, and, they, and their other little mice feet were climbing on top of each other, and they were getting out. And then they built a, a rope with their bodies, and the last person, or the last mouse, they were able to get the mouse out of the bucket. And they came to this realization because they got tired of seeing their brother or their mice brother I don't know what, they, what you would call that in the mice world, but they, were, they got tired of seeing one of the mice, as soon as he got close to the top and almost ready to get out, they would jump and grab his tail and bring him back down. And every time one mouse got ahead and one mouse almost got out, they would jump up and bring their mouse brother down. So they finally decided, let's work together and let's work united and we could all get out of this mess. This is what the church is supposed to be about not tearing one another down rather building each other up and we often see and we know profoundly if we're human beings that it's much easier to do the opposite much easier to bring somebody else down and talk bad about someone and really show off your your betterness, if we can say that, how much better you are. And it's even easier to do so in the world of social media. That's why people are so jealous nowadays because they see what everybody else is doing and they're like, why can't my life look like that? I want to be like that. I want to do that. And so instead of building one another up, we tear each other down because of a sense of pride. But Paul will address the issue in the church because these stronger believers, if we can call them that, and I'm pretty sure Paul sees them not as stronger but more arrogant. These arrogant, stronger believers do not care for their weaker brothers in Christ and are using their newfound freedom in Christ or their Christian liberty, if we're going to use religious terms, to bring their brother down. So this chapter once more deals with the unity in the body of Christ. Issues like singleness that Paul has already addressed. Issues like divorce that we spoke about profoundly in chapter 7. Issues like sexual immorality are all issues that are divisive. This is what the church has been dealing with. And at the root of all this is destruction and division. This is not what the church was supposed to be like. This is not what Christ is returning for. He's returning for a glorious church, a church washed by the blood of Christ. And so these minor issues that often lead to huge divisions also demonstrate a deeper problem, a problem of pride and arrogance. We see minor issues pop up in the church all the time. And you look at chapter 8 and you, you go from, you know, talking about sexual immorality and divorce in chapter 6 and 7 and, 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 and being called what we were called back then and and you look at all that, and then you're like, why are we talking about food? Like, it's just food. But we understand that these minor issues tend to be bigger because the root of the problem is what's really the issue. Sometimes Christians are always fighting about minor things that demonstrate a deeper issue. Like, can we drink? Is drinking evil or not. Can, can you just tell me if I am able to drink or no? Like, let me know. Can I drink? Can I dance? I like dancing. I want to dance. I want to shake it off a bit. Uh, can I go to parties? Can I party, like, with my family, with my friends? I mean, am I really supposed to live in isolation? Can I not enjoy myself? Can I get tattoos? Can I can Christians celebrate Halloween? I mean, it's just costumes and candy? Like, is that really that bad? Can I watch horror movies? I mean, 
okay, maybe not The Exorcist, but can I just watch like Scream 1, Scream 2, Scream 3, and all of these other dumb horror movies that come out? Can I listen to secular music? I just can't give up on my Ja Rule days. I never listened to Ja Rule, just, you know, that's just the first rapper that came to mind. Can I give up on my Tupac years? There you go. That gives me more legitimacy now. Uh, can I give up on, on uh, I can't think of any more, but uh, Kanye West. You know, is he Christian or not? Well, anyways, can I give up on listening to all this secular music? I mean, it's not feeding my conscience. It's not making me chase tail the way the rappers call it. It's, it's just background music for the car. Is it really that bad? And, and so... When we get to the issue of food in Corinth, it's kind of like the Christians at Corinth are seeing this with some eyes that are really like, come on, come on, Paul. Is it really that bad that I eat food or meat in this case that is offered to idols? Come on, Paul. You, you can't tell me that's bad. And we're going to see why this position is prevalent in the Corinth church. But that's the issue at heart. But again, Paul, what, what did we say at the beginning? Paul's concern here is not the food. His concern is about these arrogant Christians bringing down their brother and sister in Christ. If they come from that same background, why would they push that on them? It's kind of our, our modern case, right, where, where we... Look at drinking, whatever position that you may take, and you're like, well, the Bible says don't get drunk. It, it doesn't say you can't drink. And, and, and therefore, you, you, you have at your house, you're, you're, you, you have whatever, uh, whatever alcohol, bev alcoholic beverage you have at your house, and, and your friends come over, and, and these friends are barely newborn Christians, and, and they come from a, a household of drunkenness and, and, and a bunch of alcoholics, and maybe their own father was an alcoholic and abused them and, and hurt them as kids, and they caused the divorce in the family, and they ruptured everything, and, and their whole family line has a deep problem with alcohol. And then they go to your house that you're a Christian, and you, you probably play in the band, or you greet people at the entrance, and you're like this big Christian to them, and you sit, and they sit down at the table with you, and then they pop a 40 or whatever alcoholic beverage they got, and they just start drinking. And the new person that comes from all this background is like, whoa, what is going on? I, I, I come from this garbage, and now my, these guys that say they're Christian are doing the exact same thing that I was doing back then. Is it okay? Is this fine? So they begin to drink, and within their conscience, they're like, dealing with an issue that to them is not right, but they see their brothers doing it, so it's like, well, if they're Christian and they believe in God, then okay, maybe I could do it too. And so it's affecting their spiritual walk. So this is why Paul is so hard on this. Go back to verse 13 again. I want you to feel his, his, his demeanor here. Chapter 8, verse 13. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. See, it's emphatic. It's repeated twice. Twice in one verse, make my brother stumble, make my brother stumble. And then he says, I will never eat it to avoid this. So these issues, therefore, are not surface issues. They deal with a sense of pride in Christians and the sense of false liberty in Christ. Though they're small, they reveal these deeper spiritual matters, and they risk causing division in the church. You can imagine in Corinth, there are some Christians that are eating this food and saying to everybody, 
Don't worry about it. It's cool. It's fine. Those people over there that follow Paul and Apollos, they're too religious. Those Jewish people that come with Peter's crew, they're way too, those are even more religious rigorous. You know, the, we're, we're, this is Christianity, man. Chill, relax. Come with us. And then there's this other group of people in the church. They're like, bro, that, that, that just doesn't seem right. Even our background and the Jewish background that would t- taught us not to eat this type of meat because it's contaminated, it's polluted, it's impure. We shouldn't be doing this. And so we have division in the church. People are advocating for both cases. And so Paul has to address it. And as he writes this letter, he does so and he will address this issue because his worry, his worry is Christian unity and the body of Christ United. So for Paul, and what we're going to learn in chapter 8, is he's going to give three ways the church is to be united. Now the outline of the text is fairly simple to follow at the surface. You have a first section between verses 1 through 3. You have a second section between verses 4 through 6. And then you have the last section between 7 through 13, There are three normal divisions in this chapter. However, I want to address the chapter a little bit differently and go to the heart of the matter by beginning to discuss what Paul does so immediately. What we're going to see is three ways the church is to be or to remain united. And Paul will first address the issue. This is Paul addressing the issue, and he addresses the issue in love. We're going to see that in verse 1, or at the beginning of verse 1. We're going to see that between verses 4 and 6, and verse 8. So those verses really highlight that Paul is actually addressing the issue. And why that's important, think about it like this. The Corinthians have written to Paul, about divorce, they've been asking about sexual immorality, they've been asking about all of these things, and Paul has kind of sequentially answered every question that they've addressed. And so now, when the question arose about food, Paul could have easily just been like, guys, it's a burger, relax. And he could have just easily moved on. But instead, he takes almost three chapters to address this issue And so Paul is not evading the issue, even though it's not a difficult one or what we would say a big major issue. It's not this huge doctrinal issue, but Paul is addressing the huge spiritual issue that lies behind this. And he'll do that in chapter 8, and then he'll do it specifically in chapter 9 by calling out Christian liberty and bringing them to a true understanding of Christian liberty. And then back in chapter 10, he'll address the food topic once more. It's, It's like... An emphatic draw for Paul to be clear with his people. So he has to address the issue, and he will address the issue in love, as we will see in the beginning of verse 1, verses 4 through 6, and verse 8. Paul then moves to a second way of unity. So we address unity by addressing the main issue of division and addressing it in love. The second way to remain united in the church is To build one another up in love. We'll see that at the ending of verse 1 all the way through verse 3. So you remain united or you build a church that is united by building each other up through love. The word he's going to use, oikodomeo, is a physical construction term to build And it's the building up of one another through love instead of building themselves up. That's the contrast. You're not called to Christianity to build yourself up. You're called to build up one another. This isn't an egotistical religion or faith if you want to see it that way. This isn't about you. This is why Christianity has in its name Christ. Everything we do, everything we worship, everything we are is because of Christ. So if you're in a religion or if you're in a faith or if you're coming to church today thinking that this is something for you, you're 
in the wrong place. This isn't, you're not, we're not seeking enlightenment here. We're not seeking to find the better you here. We're seeking Christ and how to serve and build the others up. And the third way Paul will speak on how a church can remain united and how to build unity in the church is by not sinning against the weaker brother. So three things we're going to talk about in these next, I don't know how many weeks, but we'll, we'll spend what I'll say three weeks, but you know that's a lie. Uh, so maybe another four to five weeks. Uh, we're going to address these verses in this chapter one at a time so we understand the profound nature of Paul's call and claim. Again, how is Paul addressing the church? How is the church to be united? Well, first address the issue of division and address the issue through love. Second, build up one another in love. And third, don't sin against your, the weaker brother or your brothers in Christ. Notice that it's not simply about building up and not tearing down. No, Paul calls this sinning against your brother. Do not sin against your brother or sister in Christ. So let's address the issue as Paul does. And let's go to our first point this morning. Addressing the issue through love. And we see in verse 1, if you just pay attention to the beginning of verse 1, Paul says, now concerning food offered to idols. So here it is. There's the beginning of the address. Concerning food offered to idols. Then in verse 4. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, and in this section, he's going to expand it a little bit more. Take a look. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are, are all things, and through whom we exist. And then, at the beginning of verse 8, food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. So there's the issue. Food offered to idols. Well, what does that even mean? What is Paul addressing here? If you simply gloss through this chapter and, and you look at this, you may say, like, okay, so that must be, I mean, idols. We know that idols are generally bad, so this must be a bad thing. But if you don't investigate this a little bit more, uh, you, you'll miss out on what's going on here. So let's first address it. Let's, let's make sure that we know what Paul is addressing. In Roman Corinth, uh, we know uh, not, not only through the Bible, but through a ton of secular texts, historical texts, uh, historians have written extensively about the culture in the first century, in the, in the first five centuries, as a matter of fact. And Roman Corinth, as we know it, was filled with pagan temples. And so what occurred was that worshipers to these pagan temples would bring their sacrifices to the temples, which would mean often meat or animals, and bring these animals to be sacrificed to their pagan deities. And there was a ton of them all over Corinth, a ton of gods as well. Sacrificing to the gods, therefore, was an integral part of the ancient life. This is how they lived. This was normal to them. It was just part of their daily life. Life. It, I remember being young and spending some, some summers in Mexico and, and early, like around 5.30 in the morning or 5 o'clock or sometimes 6 o'clock, you would hear some, some ringing, ding, 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 awa, 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 and, the, and people were screaming water. And it's like, what in the world is going on here? And to everybody else, it was normal. And I was like, who in their right mind at 5.30 in the morning screams down the street, awa? water and it was the water guy that would come bring 
the garrafones or the big pitchers of water and give it to the houses. And people would open the door and take these out. Or they would scream, leche. Or they would scream, gas. And this happened like every day of the week in Mexico. And I was like, how do people not go mad? How do these people not get shot? But it was just part of their culture. This is just normal, normalcy in Mexico. The same way sacrificing to idols was simply normal. This wasn't some extreme cases in some places in Corinth. This was normal. People worshipped the idols, and in their lives, this was consistent. They did this either privately or publicly. In a private sacrifice or like by an individual, a private sacrifice will often include three aspects. They would sacrifice the the meat and then divide it into three portions. One, obviously, for the God, the sacrifice. The other portion of the meat was given to the priests that were offering those sacrifices. And the third part of the meat was taken by the worshiper. So the person that brought the meat or the animal will take a third of it home. And this would often lead to having a banquet at the home or at the temple. And in this banquet, they would gather all their friends and people together to simply worship again what they had just done to their gods. This food, therefore, that was offered to the god was taken home and eaten and cooked and given to the friends. So the problem would begin to surface because would Christians in Corinth be able to attend these parties or events? Because this is obviously a daily practice. This is daily going on. This is part of the Corinthian culture Can a Christian participate in these events? What if their best friend for years invited them over to attend this kind of a cookout, if we could say it like that. Cookouts are so normal for us. Cookout. A lot of these important social events followed the same pattern. And the food of these major social events in the Corinthian society mainly dealt with idol food, weddings, parties, even being part of certain social clubs. Events like this that were either done in the private home or in the temple halls were done frequently and therefore part of the culture in Corinth. And so to exclude yourself from that would mean to kind of live under a rock. The Christians at Corinth had to deal with Therefore, with this issue, can a Christian participate with everything that's going on? And the public sacrifices were like the private ones, except the public sacrifices that also divided the meat portions into three. When the priest that offered these public sacrifices for the benefit and for the good of the city... They would keep some for themselves, offer some to the gods, and then the third part of the portion was sold off into the meat markets or to the sellers of meat, to the shops that were all around the city. So basically the entire Corinthian town, all the shops, everywhere you would shop like Jewel or like we say in Chicago, Jewel's. Or uh, whatever other shop. I hardly ever go shopping, so I don't know shopping stores. Tony's, whatever. All these places contained food or meat that was offered to idols. Because this is where they would source it from. And then they would go on and sell it to those that were shopping. So all of this meat surrounded the Corinthian culture. Does this make the meat automatically impure then can a christian in corinth eat of this meat i mean it's everywhere my friend's house at at the mall at the shopping center at costco this meat is everywhere can a christian buy this meat so you begin to see that when paul addresses the concern this is no small matter this is almost dealing with your entire Life. To make problems even worse in Corinth, the Corinthian culture lived in fear of demons. 
and of the evils around them. Basically, all first century culture was like this. Demons, as we see even in the Bible, desire to enter bodies of people. This is the thought of the Corinthian culture or Roman society in general. Demons were always looking to take part of the body of someone. And, as, and so what they believed is that demons would often go into food and therefore be able to enter the body of someone and then take over that body. So the reason why this constant sacrificing in the temples, it wasn't necessarily a pious thing that we would say like, oh, wow, they were just practicing their religion. Well, the reality of it was that even though that took case in it, they were also afraid to death. They were scared for their lives. And so everything that they would bring home to eat, they would take a portion of that to the temple and cleanse it and, or, or hope that the gods would take over the meat and therefore no demons would enter. And so the Christian at Corinth would have to deal with this issue as well. To make problems even worse for the Christians, we have a religious issue going on in Corinth, especially in the Christian community. What about the old Jewish understanding of improper foods? There's still Jewish people in Corinthians, and there's also Jewish people or Christians that were once Jewish. So it's not just the Gentile church that Paul is addressing. He's also addressing Jews that or former Jews that are now Christians and actual Jews. His concern is driving a wedge between Jewish believers and those who are Gentile believers. For the Jew, it's an obvious solution that no one should eat the food or meat offered to idols because they are simply impure. This is what we read in the in the dietary laws that we find in Leviticus chapter 9, or chapter 10 specifically. The, they were Banned from eating food that is impure. It's kosher laws. Kosher, even today, is extreme. You can't eat certain breads. You can't eat certain things. It has to be purified. So the new Christian converts also that entered into the church were also told something important. I want you to see this. Go to Acts. Turn with me to the book of Acts. And at the one of the first ecumenical councils or one of the first councils in church history, for those that took my church history class, this is probably bringing back bad memories. The first council in the church history existed in Acts chapter 15. And the issue here is simple. Gentiles are becoming converted and they're joining the church and they're coming into the synagogues where the Jewish people were kind of like, no, you can't come into our synagogue. You're a Gentile. And, and but, you know, the the apostles are like, no, but now they're, they're Christians. And like you, we're all Christians now. So we don't consider ourselves Gentiles or Jews. We're, we're Christians. And so there was a problem. There was a divisive problem going on. Can a Gentile go to synagogue or be part of the overall community? And the Jewish people were like, oh, this is hard. So when the apostles come together to convene, they finally come and they, and they resolve the issue. And part of the way they resolve it, if you read in chapter 15... Let's go from verse 24. We'll start in verse 24. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us having come to one accord to choose men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you that the same things by word of mouth, where it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to, to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. So now they're speaking to the people that were rejected. Verse 29. That you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. So that's part of the solution for these new Christian converts. One of it was, do not eat food that has been sacrificed to idols. So the, the issue is broad, and it's heavy, and it's daunting. And so Paul, going back 
1 Corinthians chapter 8 has to address this. And, and go now to verse 4, as we saw, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, look at what Paul, how he begins to address this. We know. And so the question is, what do you know? Know what? Well, for Paul, it could be two things. The grammar here allows for two possibilities that Paul is either quoting directly from the Christian letter by saying what they believe to know, or Paul is generalizing this as a conflated term for Christian faith. Whatever the case may be, if it's done or if knowledge is used improperly, it is wrong. So Paul will begin here. What do you know? They, they know that idols do not really exist. This is common in Israel, right? In, in the Jewish, the, the prophets would make fun of idols. They would say they're made of wood, they're images, they're carved, they, they're, your, their hands break, they, they don't see. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. They're, they're just worthless images. So for a lot of the Israel uh, people, the people from, from Israel, this knowledge was kind of like, come on, it's an idol. It, it doesn't mean anything. One of the commentators, in, in, in one of my favorite commentators in the book of First Corinthians says, the knowledge that an idol is nothing in the world probably provided a theological justification for some Corinthians to think that they could attend the feast in idol temples without impunity or without getting in trouble. So it was just because they're idols. So they thought eating food that were offered to idols cannot affect a Christian in any way. This is kind of the demeanor of some of the Jewish, Jewish Christians that are in Corinth. It's kind of like it's just the burger syndrome, right? It's just the, a burger. I'm trying to be careful because my kids would grow up calling it bo boogers and, and just a burger. So that's what they're basically trying to say. It's just a burger. Paul agrees theologically with them, but their practice isn't right or correct. He also addresses their knowledge on a theological level because in verse 4, he goes to the Shema. And one of the things that he calls out from the wonderful Shema is the one God understanding. Israel knows that there is only one God. And so idols really don't play any role here. There's no issue if there is only one God. And so although their unity and the knowledge is correct, but if it's not applied in love, it is worthless, as we will see in the verses 1 through 3 later on. Knowledge can unite, but go back to verse 4. I'm sorry, go back to verse 1. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up. That's the issue. Knowledge done incorrectly only puffs up. This is the conceited attitude of knowledge. This is the negative aspect of knowledge. It's not the good form of knowledge. For Paul, what the Corinthians are doing is using their sense of knowledge or their understanding against them because it's puffing them up. It's making them think they're better than what they really are. And so instead of building their brothers up in Christ, they're actually tearing each other down. And what their confession has stated is what they're actually falling into. What's at stake? What's at stake is idolatry. If Israel knows this, if Israel knows the heaviness of even Jewish law, they understand that God hates idolatry. It's in their own confession. And this is what they supposedly know. For the Jewish understanding, idols are clear and not real, but cannot be minimized because these so-called gods that they learned about and that they know about Stand, what's standing behind them are demonic powers. 
I want you to see this in the book of Deuteronomy. Turn there, and we'll start wrapping this up. But I want you to see this in the book of Deuteronomy. It's not simply that they're idols and that they're images. But look at chapter 4, verse 19. Chapter 4, verse 19. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. What's standing behind idolatry, friends, is worship. Go, go to chapter 30, 32. This makes it a little bit more clear. Deuteronomy chapter 32 Verse 17. Deuteronomy 32, verse 17. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods. To gods they had never known. To new gods that had come recently whom your fathers had never dreaded. See, what's going on is that although idols are simply images, what stands behind them compels the individual to worship. What stands behind an idol are demon powers that guide people away from God. So one of the ways Paul will see this tearing down of the weaker brother is by making him an idolater. And not only making him an idolater, the one doing it is also an idolater, for he knows that there is only one God. And so to eat meat that is offered to idols, it's not the meat that's the problem. It's the demons behind that that have compelled an entire generation to seek and to bow down to worship false idols. That is the problem. And that's one of the ways Paul sees this issue. And, and it's more than just the burger, friends. What's at stake here is idolatry. Now, I want you to see one last verse. Go back to 1 Corinthians and the verse that Paul will address later on in chapter 10. Look at what Paul says over here in chapter 10, verse 19. Chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, verse 19. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So, although this is an introductory matter in chapter 8, as it develops, Paul will make sure that this issue closes by focusing the attention on more than just food. It's what stands behind this, and it's demon worship. It's pagan worship. So the church, instead of acting like nonchalant, and acting like everything's okay and drink and party, have sex with whoever you want to have sex with, do everything, everything, have fun. Anyway, God has forgiven you. Christ has forgiven you. You're free. Enjoy your life. Instead of acting like a foolish person, Paul is saying, you're actually an idolater. And this idolatry is breaking down and dividing the church. So these issues, my friend, are no small feats. The year... They're tremendous, and they need to be addressed. And I pray this morning that as you begin to learn about this, you also begin to bring weight to weightier matters in your life. You may think that it's just Netflix. You may think that it's just pornography. You may think that it's just alcohol. You may think that it's just something minor. It's not. What lies behind it is also guiding your worship. And sooner or later, you're going to have to answer the question, what God are you going to worship? Sometimes it's easier to go towards where your body wants instead of what your spirit wants. 
So be careful with that. And with that, this morning, church, will come to an end. I want you to stand. Pastor Ishmael will lead us in a benediction this morning. It was great to be with you guys this morning. And again, happy Father's Day.